these things are very practical questions that depend on continuous models. But we have to be really careful, and this is part of what we're gonna to unpack today and in the next week or so, because while continuous random variables share a lot in common with discrete random variables, they're clearly not the same, and importantly, some of the techniques and strategies that we use with discrete random variables, they do not work with continuous random variables. Um, and I wanna give you a couple of examples of that. Number one, um, like we said before, the continuous random variable, you can put in um, a, any value you like. You can put in, uh, in this case, 12 and a half. But that doesn't make any sense in this situation. You can't have 12 and a half coins facing upwards, right? You can only have 12 or 13. I keep saying this to try and emphasize to you that discrete data and continuous data do behave differently even when they're described in the same situation. Um, and I said to you that the, the strategies or the tools that we have with discrete random variables, they're parallel, but they don't always work neatly with continuous random variables. So to give you an example of that, I want us to return practically to this word of discrete random variables. And I'd like you to think about a simple situation, which is if we were to roll two dice, okay? Now, if we were rolling two dice, and then we were adding up the, um, the sums, we were finding the sum of the two up-facing uh, faces, then pretty predictably, I think we could all come up with this. This is, a, this is the sample space, right? It's a, a two-way kind of like dot diagram, a table that shows all of the possibilities. And what's great about this is it shows which ones can happen more frequently and which happens less frequently, right? So if I took these outcomes and I just uh, you know, drew them into a chart, it would look something like this. Do you agree with that, right? Some of the outcomes, like two, um, are far less common because you have to have um, a one and a one. There's only one way for that to happen. But other outcomes are much more frequent. You know, six, seven, and eight, there's lots of combinations of dice that will give you that outcome. So that's why on the chart they are higher. Now I wonder if any of you remember what this kind of chart is called. Um, again, there's lots of words in this topic that you really need to wrap your head around. This is a relative frequency histogram, okay? And we got quite used to using these relative frequency histograms to answer questions about probability, right? Um, let me give you an example, okay? Can you use this table to answer the question, what's the probability that I'm going to roll a five? That my variable, which in this case is the sum, the two dice, um, what will be the chance that it's a five? Now, I think we all know we can look at the relative frequency histogram and we can say, oh, just look at the relevant column, right? Now that goes up to four and 36, so you simplify that to one over nine. So you're like, no problem, I can answer that. Just look at that individual column. But now if we think about what happens if you brought it out, how do I consider multiple values? And again, with discrete random variables, this is not hard, right? Um, from four to seven, we're saying four, five, six, and seven, they're all um, fair game. They're all uh, possibilities or outcomes that I'm interested in. So to work out the probability, all I have to do is look at all of those individual probabilities and add them up, right? It's not complicated. So in this case, uh, three over 36 plus four over 36 plus five over 36 plus six over 36, whatever that happens to equal, um, which by the look of it is 18 over 36, so half, I guess, um, that's going to give you the probability. All right, one last one, just for the sake of it. Um, what about the probability from 2 to 12? 2 to 12? Have a think about this one. So this is all the probabilities, right? This is everything all together. So if I were to add up the probabilities without any calculation, I know this is the whole thing, so it's clearly going to be equal to 1, or 100%, okay? Now, I hope that you know sort of is stuff that you remember, but I want you to see why those ideas are parallel but slightly problematic when you try and apply them to continuous random variables, okay? Um, let's suppose, for example, what we wanted to represent was um, the distribution of heights in this classroom, okay? Now, first question, why is that a continuous random variable? Answer, height is something that you measure. It's not something that you count, right? Um, you know, you could be anywhere between, say, you know, 160 centimeters and 170 centimeters. It's not like you can only be 161 or only 162. You can take any value in between. So this is what we mean by there's a, there's a continuum, so it's a continuous random variable, okay? Now, one of the things that marks a continuous random variable, if you have a look at the graph of it, and I, I'm just making this graph up, okay, but I think it's, you know, a reasonably accurate one, um, it's gonna be a smooth curve, right? Um, I've got probabilities here, and they're not going to be nice, neat blocks like we saw with the dice. Um, this curve here represents all the different probabilities of one height or another, okay? 
Now this curve here, because it is a curve and it represents probability, it gets a different name. We don't call this a histogram, we call this guy a probability density function. So um, the denser the probability is, the higher it is, um, you know, the higher the graph is, okay? Now, I said to you before that when you're using continuous random variables, the tools from discrete random variables don't all work neatly. And I can give you a very simple example of why that's a problem. You remember I asked you before, oh, what's the probability of rolling a five? And you just looked at the bar on the chart and you're like, oh, it's equal to that, and then off you go, okay? But if I ask you a parallel question, but for this, you know, heights, right? Um, we run into problems really quickly, right? For example, suppose I ask you, what's the probability of um, selecting someone in the class who has a height of 178 centimeters? Now you might wonder why did I randomly choose that number and the answer is it's because I'm a bit self-centered and 178 centimeters is my height, okay? Now the reason why this is problematic is, let's just think about this for a second, right? Um, suppose I said, okay, there's like a, roughly 20 people in the room, so you know, one out of 20 is about 0.05, okay? If I said the probability of picking that height is 0.05, the first problem with that is my height is not exactly 178 centimeters. Maybe it's 178.1 or 177.9. I actually don't even know because I just measure and I remember to the nearest centimeter, okay? So number one, my value may not actually be 0.05. But even if it wasn't that, suppose it was something lower like 0.01 or 0.001, no matter how low it is, because you've got this continuous function here, right? Um, there's an infinite number of other possible heights, right? So if the probability of my height was 0 0.01, let's call it 178, then what would be the probability of 178.1 and the probability of 178.2? If they were all you know, 0 0.01 and you added them all up, then you're going to go over one. You have, in fact, an infinite series of these. And because there's so many of them, even if they're all, you know, adding up to a small thing, they could add up to something more than one. And that's a big problem. We know probabilities can't do that. So this is not a good way to think about a continuous random variable. Um, in fact, the only way you can talk about a single value is that its individual probability is zero. So this is no good. I don't like that. It's not a very helpful way to think about it, even if it is technically accurate. So what's our solution, okay? Um, there was a long journey um, that mathematicians took to try and arrive at a solution to this paradox, but I'm going to sort of cut to the chase so that we can start working with these things. The solution for how to address this problem is to not think about individual values in a continuous random variable, but to think about intervals on a continuous random variable. If we think about the probability of um, not just your height being this, but your height being between two values, right, like say 170, and 180. Um, this completely solves our problem because what we can do is we can assign any kind of value that's relevant to our data. We might say, ah, oh, the probability of being 150 to 160 in our class is 4%. And the probability of being in the next class up, 160 to 170, that might be 17%. And when you add all of those up, because I've got four separate chunks, right, there's not an infinite number of them, I can add all of these up and I get 100% or, or 1, right, which I know is what probabilities are supposed to do. So this is kind of a bit topsy-turvy, right? Earlier we were saying discrete data, if it's large enough, often looks continuous, so you can model it in a continuous way. But to deal with continuous data, um, often the best way to actually handle it is to break it into discrete chunks. And I kind of think that's why um, this topic is called random variables. We're going to focus on continuous random variables, but you kind of can't easily separate discrete and continuous. Um, they're kind of two helpful lenses to look at the same kinds of realities. You just have to be careful which lens you're using. Okay? So you can see here, like we said, we solved the problem. Everything adds up to one. There's just one catch. If you want to be able to do this and calculate the probabilities of these intervals, right, these classes, and what you need is the ability to work out not just the area under a nice neat rectangular bar chart, like the histograms we've seen before. What you need is to be able to work out the area underneath your probability density function, even when your probability density function is this weird, unusual, curvy kind of you know, object. If only we had some kind of level of maths or area of maths that allowed us to work out areas under curves. And probably you're starting to now connect what's going on here in your brain, but before we get to that, 
And I promise, you know, if the gears are turning, I will, we will reward that concept connecting in your brain. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I want to stop talking and let you guys have a, a, get a handle on this practically. So I want you to think about this um, example scenario here. Okay, it's a continuous random variable. And I want you to have a go at these questions, right? Firstly, I want you to have a look and think, why is this a continuous random variable and not a discrete random variable? Can anyone tell me? Have a think, okay? Look, uh, take, some, take a moment to you know, dissect what's going on. Um, what is it that's being measured here? This is, this is times, right? This is the variable. And so because it's a measured variable, not a counted variable, that's what makes this a continuous random variable, okay? So that's why we're in this situation. Um, secondly, can you see why the data has been broken up into classes? It's what I was showing you before on that graph, right? We need to have separate sections or intervals so we can um, work out the probabilities of each. Um, we're going to do frequency and work out relative frequency by dividing by the total number of things. So we have frequency relative to the size of the whole group, okay? So this stuff is revision. I'm going to let you guys have a go at that. Um, and then we will come back together when you've made a bit of progress and uh, we will try and answer some questions um, that are really to do with continuous random variables um, in a continuous way. Okay, so off you go, um, see how far you can get.